phishing purposes. <clears throat> Should you not want your information to be published for the purposes stated above, kindly send your concerns to rajpaul at ukzn.ac.za. During the course of the events, all attendees will be muted with their video switched off. If you have any questions during the presentation, kindly post them in the chat box facility where someone will be there to answer it. During the Q&A session, the presenter will give you a chance to ask your questions. Please raise your hand so that the tech person can allow you to unmute and pose your questions to the presenter. If by any chance attendees interfere with the presentations, we will note your details and remove you from the event. Finally, the recordings will be emailed to all attendees present and will also be posted on the CAES website. I would now like to hand over to Dr. Mandla Guetu, who is the discipline leader for um, computer science. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lena. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Computer Science Tech Talk uh, series that is facilitated in partnership with the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science Public Relations Office. Today, we host one of the significant players in the South African and African financial services sector. They make investments grow. And uh, to do that, I believe they need a lot of algorithms. They need a lot of technical infrastructure to make the whole process efficient and effective. This is another great company that has in the past offered computer science uh, graduates from UKZN employment opportunities, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, they have representatives here today to speak to our students about opportunities they have on offer and how to access them. They have also come to share of their expertise and experience in the world of open source software. They have also come with one of our former CS students to give you insights on what it's like in the working world. I'd like to say welcome to all our students. Please enjoy today's Tech Talk, which is meant to empower and inspire you. Please post questions in the chat box, which will be monitored. Towards the end of the talk, you'll be unmuted so you can get a chance to post live audio questions. I encourage you to feel free to interact mm -hmm. with our guest via these facilities. In the first part of today's Tech Talk, we will hear from Monique Williams from Allen Gray Recruitment, followed by Barry Jordan, who is a systems architect at Allen Gray. Then finally, Kimon Pillay, our alumni who's working at Allen Gray. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I will hand over to Monique Williams. Hi, Mantle. Thank you so much for the introduction. And um, we're very excited to be here. Um, we thank you for always welcoming us to, to your events um, and to interact with your with the students. Um, I'm sure you know we we Quite enjoy taking people from UKZN. We've got quite a few uh, grads who who all started as grads who moved into developer roles um, on our floor. So um, we always enjoy these sessions. So thank you. Um, just uh, yeah, as Mandra said, I'm here to uh, just talk about our grad and our intern uh, program. Um, and before I get there, I just want to grab my screen share. Bear with me. Before I get there, I just want to tell you a little bit more about our actual environment, because those are the things that will eventually get you to uh, potentially apply. So give me a second. <clears throat> okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so great. So what I'm going to jump into first uh, is just straight into just to tell you a little bit more about our, our environment at Allen Gray. Um, you'll be surprised to know that we hold quite a large portion of, of the employees at Allen Gray. We uh, take up 20 percent of of the floor. Um, we've got about 300 technical people in the building. Um, and from that, um, we've got about 20 Agile teams, I think it is now. Um, and 
it uh, basically the agile teams would be ba based or made up from back-end devs, scrum masters, technical testers, product owners, tech leads, business analysts, and front-end devs. Um, so we've got a lot of area or well, a lot of areas around or you know in terms of data analysts and all the rest of it. Um, but what we generally look for are developers to join our team from universities. Uh, we've Got a lot of perks. I'm sure everyone knows about the perks at Ellen Gray. I think it's widely spoken of in terms of uh, we get quite we get attractive performance bonuses. Um, we've got free lunches. I think there's five or six options that you can choose from on a daily basis. Um, we've got an on-site gym, uh, flexible working hours, heaps of further learning. So it's very much a learning environment, and on-site psychologists as well as uh, biokineticists. Um, our tech stack is, is quite progressive, and I think that uh, this allows for us to really um, move, yeah, basically move fast. I don't know if any of you recognize any of this tech, these uh, technologies over here, um, but it really allows for you to move fast within the environment um, just because you'd, well, basically you'd be working on microservices platform or microservices environment, which I'm sure Barry can, can answer any questions on that. Um, and it just allows team, teams to move faster and um, basically creates, yeah, it's, it's quite a progressive tech stack if you, if you have to look it up um, and maybe if you have any experience in using these. Um, we currently have, I think it's around 70 devs in our retail IT space. Um, and as I mentioned, that's what we are predominantly hiring for from universities. Okay, so what we found um, is obviously there's a definite gap from university to the working world. Um, at universities, you're you're very much taught um, problem solving skills. You're taught resilience, uh, programming fundamentals, all those good things that will help you adopt new languages when you move into the, the working world, and obviously um, apply your problem solving skills uh, to to your new environment. So basically for, for us, we don't necessarily look at the tech stack that you focused on within university. Um, so we've got uh, a great bootcamp, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And that is where we take you from studying through to the working world and learning a brand new tech stack um, and obviously building your skills in, in development teams. Okay, so this is kind of what you can expect from, I guess, some companies. I'm not sure if, if all companies um, run boot camps, but in terms of the or, or in terms of the research that we've done, there are a number of companies who do have boot camps. Um, and basically they'll take you through training on their specific tech stack. Um, you should have access to experienced developers just from learning perspective. Um, you focus on building production ready features and work readiness for a specific work culture. I think things that you need to look out for, obviously maybe there may be more pressure and expectations on you to succeed. I think that's in every environment, including ours though. Um, and might still be exposed to busy developers, um, you need to ensure that the tech stack is relevant. And, and when I say is relevant, I think to your learning. So joining companies with very old tech stacks, you might need to do some research on that first um, and just see what sort of route you want to go down in terms of Microsoft, open, open source, et cetera. And obviously seeing if the culture is right for you. Okay, so this is what the bootcamp looks like in Alan Gray. Um, basically, you join on day one and uh, you would attend a little bit of a, a company um, orientation with the rest of the experienced devs. Um, and then you go straight into a three month full on bootcamp. Um, over here, uh, yeah, we typically have between 10 and 15. Uh, interns, oh, sorry, graduates who join. Um, I think we've actually got about 18 offers out for next year. So it's going to be quite a large group if everyone accepts. Um, and they're all put into a big sort of area and they work in different teams and they work on various problem solve, various problems within the business um, and projects. And um, they've got mentors, they've got coaches, they've got 
all the support that they need in order to really understand the environments um, and learn all of the different tech stacks within the Alan Gray um, environment. Right, so we learn some, we learn about agile, we learn about the technical testing, we learn about microservices, you learn everything and you've got hands on uh, support throughout those three months. Um, from a coaching perspective, um, oh, sorry. Let me just go back over there. Um, so yes, we focus on our, uh, our department tech stack, as I mentioned, is, is quite progressive. Um, and the Microsoft architecture, which is um, also, I think it's great exposure to, to get, um, as I mentioned, it really helps you, or teams are able to, um, it, it's a very modern architecture, which is, it's been used very successfully in huge companies and teams can basically move faster as they independently build and deploy their pieces of architecture. All right, so in terms of applying at Alan Gray, as I mentioned, we've got 18 offers out. So um, with about 13 people who've accepted. Um, so I'll take you a little like through a little bit of the process and then just let you know what's in store for next year. Okay, so our Essentially, we send out um, an advert for when we're looking for interns, and we hope to get most of our offers for permanent hires as a graduate uh, from our internship. Okay, so we open our internship uh, applications in March, and then we run the internship in June and July, and we would work on software development projects within teams of interns supported by technical coaches. It's kind of like a mini boot camp. Um, except for you don't have the time to obviously go through the whole tech stack. So we give you a project, but you do have coaches and you've got mentors to help you through the way. Um, it is quite stressful, um, but I think that's the point. Uh, and we've also had feedback that people, I, I guess it's a stress point, which is where you grow the most. So um, we've had some really good feedback from the IT in internship too. Um, you get exposure from different areas of the business. Um, you give various presentations, um, learn scrum methodologies, and it is a paid internship for everybody. But if you're not living in Cape Town, then we fly you up to Cape Town for those two or three weeks, set you up in accommodation at the waterfront. Um, there are, obviously there's lunch every day and there's meal vouchers um, and there are various other things that you do, like going on the bus rides and, and some touristy things that, um, we set you up with in the hopes that you would eventually move to Cape Town, of course. All right. Um, sorry, just to go back over here, I feel like I've missed a slide. Um, bear with me. Yeah. Okay. When it comes to the actual grad recruitment, which would be either for 2023 2024 we also obviously if you're relocating then we contribute to we offer relocation assistance um also help you with when you're settling down to to put you in a, an apartment for for two months i think it is um and we pay for flights and all the rest of it so it is it is very much doable from a financial perspective okay so i think we would be looking at next year opening applications around about March. Um, so for the month of March, uh, I think this year we got, it was about 1,200 applications. So it was it was quite, quite a lot and it took heaps of time, but I think it was very worth it. Um, we'd be running the internship uh, again, depending on, on VAC dates over there, June, uh, looking at offers towards the end and then if we don't have all of our hires or all of our grads um, from this process, then we open up the grad applications. Um, and then the start of the bootcamp would be the year after. That's meant to say 2023. Cool. So as I mentioned, we've got a lot of offers out already. And unfortunately, we aren't able to make more offers for next year. And so we've got a consolidated view of how many people will be joining us for next year. 
Um, so if you are interested, then um, please add your details, just uh, scan this code. I'll put the link in this chat as well. Uh, scan this code, just put your details in and what we would be doing, uh, I guess expected feedback is, is quite far away because we, we need to wait for um, obviously the, the current state of, of accepted offers. Um, but if you're looking to do an internship next year, then what we would be doing is uh, sending our details to you first or the application to you first. Um, and obviously we'd be able to, to sort of give you a head start in, in applying. So, and that would be for, I mean, there's a few questions over there that kind of cover grad 2024, grad 2023 in case people don't accept as well as internship for next year. And that is it from me. Awesome. Yeah, thank okay. you. Oops. Not a problem. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Monique. Uh, we'll hand over to you just now, Barry. Um, yeah, it's it's just interesting to note that we've got you've got twenty plus IT teams, seventy devs. You know that's big and sounds exciting, and it's also good to know that UKZN plays a small part in contributing to that. To our students, I hope you heard. There's currently eighteen offers that have been made for next year. It's good to know that uh, UKZN CS has in the past, you know, made the cut from about 1,200 applications, as you've heard. <laughs> uh, so you're probably in good hands. And uh, one of those opportunities could be yours in the coming years. So thank you so much, Monique, for sharing about your opportunities to our students. Thanks, next, Amanda. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Barry Jordan. Barry, I can't, hear to, uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say about uh, the open source world. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Cool. Thank you. Let me just uh, share my slides here. Okay. Can you guys see that okay? I'm assuming so. Um, okay. Um, thanks for joining uh, today. So my name is Barry and I am a solutions architect at Alan Gray. Um, Joined Alan Gray about six years ago, came in as a, a senior software developer, um, and I have been and still am loving my time at Alan Gray, I've got to say. Um, so what I'm going to share with you today is um, kind of a, a range of topics around open source software, um, and this is particularly relevant to, to Alan Gray as we do use a lot of open source software internally. Um, and I also hope that, you know, I want to give you some practical advice that you can take away and start using today. Um, so not full of theory. Um, so, I mean, uh, I think people often have a perception that open source software is software that you can just take and use freely um, off the internet, download it, use it as you like, but that's, that's not quite accurate in all cases. Um, so initially, I just want to give a little, little description what open source is. <laughs> So open source is generally freely licensed um, and the source code is, is openly available for you to see and share. And what's important here is the freely licensed part because very often there are different licenses associated with it. Um, and I'll go through that a little later. I think it's worth just very briefly going through the history and some milestones with open source software because it, it really highlights the kind of ethos um, of open source software and the mentality of sharing uh, and openness that, that is kind of fostered in that community. Um, kind of prior to the late 60s, um, a lot of software was just bundled with hardware. So um, it, it wasn't seen as a, a separate entity. Um, often the hardware, the software would need to be customized uh, for use with that particular hardware in its use case. Um, but in the late 60s, Unix was the first kind of open operating system that was developed that could be used across uh, many different kind of bits of hardware. Um, 69 was also when the first kind of incarnation of the internet, which is ARPANET started, which made it much easier to share um, software. So during the 70s, uh, you know, businesses uh, kind of tweaked that, you know, um, software 
as a, as an entity on its own could be packaged and sold commercially. Um, Unix itself started to be to be licensed, meaning that people would have to pay for updates. Also during that period, there was kind of a movement like the hacker movement, not like we think of hackers today as in trying to break into systems, but the original hacker movement was around um, fostering knowledge, sharing software, learning um, and openness. And one of its advocates, Richard Stallman, didn't like the way the licensing world was going. And he decided that he wanted to start a project that would make a full operating system and software freely available for people to use. So that was ongoing throughout the, the 1980s. Um, it was contributed to openly by some businesses, but also a lot of um, individual contributors. Um, and it was only when Linux came out um, and was developed and open source in 91 that the GNU project plus combined with Linux um, provided this kind of um, full operating system that anyone could use um, for free. Um, I mean, those, those two pieces are still developed to this day. The 90s was kind of a golden era of web development and kind of, you know, leading up to kind of the dot-com, the initial dot-com boom. Um, so Apache, which is still, you know, has a massive market share. It's still going today, almost 30 to 40% of the market share. It's Apache open source web server. Netscape, um, they essentially made their web browser source code free for anyone to view and read. Um, and that's where the, the term open source actually originally coined slightly after that. And then we've got Ubuntu and GitHub. So GitHub is the largest um, kind of code repository in the world um, where pretty much all open source projects can be found. So I'll just wanna talk very briefly about licensing and ownership. It's it's not an exciting topic, I gotta admit, but it's it's very valuable in knowing what you're dealing with with open source. Um, if for instance, you and your friends decide, okay, we wanna start a company, we're gonna write some code, we're gonna leverage some, some open source software out there and we want to sell that software, you kind of need to know if there's anything or licenses attached to that open source software you're using. So I think this is this is pretty interesting and relevant so open source software, it's free of cost, but you aren't free to use it as you wish. Um, and there's varying degrees of licenses around this. So, you know, if you use something um, that has a particular license, and you decide to, to, to kind of close source your software, somebody could come along and sue you uh, and actually make you publish your software um, code for free. When we talk about licenses, there are more permissive and then there's the least permissive. Um, and I'll just give you some examples of this. Uh, public domain, you won't really see this around, but it essentially means you can do whatever you want um, with that software. Permissive licenses, um, if you go on to GitHub or, or any of the big code repositories, the majority of the licenses are permissive, meaning that they actually do contain a little license, but you're pretty much free to take that software, to use it, to change it and to republish it in any way you want, um, as long as you just keep that license in there. And really all that license does is it says that the, the producer of that piece of software is indemnified. So you're taking that software um, and you know, you're know you responsible for what happens when you use it. If something goes wrong, they're not responsible. A slightly stricter license is copyleft license. And this really ties into the whole ethos of um, using software, but also you having to give back to uh, the software community. Um, it's called a viral license. And, and kind of it means that if you take software and you adapt it and you publish your own, you have to publish that software under that same license. Meaning that there's this kind of perpetual uh, creation of software and publicly making it available for other people to use. And the most strictest is obviously kind of closed source software or proprietary. So, you know, businesses that, that kind of um, uh, code their own solutions and, and they sell and license it like that. Here's just some of the, the common licenses you might see around. The Apache, MIT and BSD are probably ones if you've been to GitHub or any of these code repositories or you've downloaded software yourself, um, you probably have come across these. 
Um, the copy left ones are ones you need to be more aware of if you plan to, for instance, build and sell your own software. So this is just a, a little screenshot from GitHub. Um, Axios is a, an open source JavaScript HTTP client that runs on Node. Um, if you just look on the right-hand side here, um, we can see a little link for README, and then we can see an MIT license. And if you click through on that, GitHub gives you a nice little description of what you're allowed to do um, and what that license means. So MIT license, you can use it pretty much in every way you, you want, as long as you just keep that little license notice um, with the source code, the original license notice. So, I mean, the obvious benefits um, that people see with open source is that it's free, but um, there are a lot of other benefits and there are also quite a few pitfalls that you, you kind of need to be aware of. Um, so transparency, quality and security. Transparency means that open source software is developed publicly. So anyone in the world can go into GitHub, they can view this software, they can download it, they can contribute to it in many cases. Uh, they can send merge requests. Um, and this transparency means that, you know, you have a variety of people from a very diverse background, you know, uh, race, religion, gender, um, different countries all over the world. Um, and all of these very background and skill sets can really add up to produce very good quality software um, and secure as well. So the thinking is the power of community. So the more eyes that are looking at the software, um, you know, the, the more secure it is and the higher quality it ends up. And often with a lot of these open source projects, um, a lot of the contributors are very, very highly skilled software developers who are contributing their own time to these software projects um, for whatever reason. There's many reasons. Um, there's the, the belonging to community, there's respect of peers, um, there's to, to keep up their skill set to contribute back um, to the world. Um, so these are all benefits of, of the open source community. Obviously, it's cost effective. Um, if you're using it, you haven't had to develop it. Um, and in terms of flexibility and innovation, uh, you can essentially, as a business, for instance, Alan Gray, uh, we could quickly take something open source. We could download it. Uh, we could we could proof of concept, play around with it and see if it'll fit our needs quite quickly without having to review a lot of commercial project products, pay for initial um, fees up front, et cetera. Okay, so, so lots of benefits with open source software. Okay, pitfalls. And um, we've, we've kind of encountered quite a number of these at Alan Gray. One is abandonment, okay? And that means that uh, an open source project has been has been run for a few years, it's been pretty stable, but the, the kind of maintainer or maintainers of this project, you know, for whatever reason, personal reasons or time limitations, they, they just can't maintain it anymore. And nobody else has come along to take up that mantle. Um, so what happens there is the project doesn't get updated. Over time, it becomes stale um, and, and security vulnerabilities could be found, bugs creep in, um, you know, the software that's based on goes out of date. So that's a, that's a very real issue with using open source software. A change in license. Um, this has actually occurred with the Java programming language, which was completely free um, from Oracle. And version 8, they decided that after version 8, um, they would license this and pe people would have to pay for updates. So that was a huge change within, within the software development industry um, around licensing changes. Security vulnerabilities are also um, quite a big issue. They're, they're gonna be the same with closed or open source software. Um, and a lot of the high profile um, stories you'll hear around open source are often because security vulnerabilities have been found in them um, because open source is so pervasive and used by so many companies out there. Um, yeah, there's often such a huge scramble to, to patch those as quickly as possible. And there can be hidden costs. I mean, you know, taking something, just downloading off the internet, um, you know, you don't get any knowns there to train you on the software. You have to rely on documentation. Um, you got to make sure it's maintained yourself over time. You got to upskill. You got to learn how to operate it. So there are costs there as well. And often there's a lack of support. Okay, so. It's not like a commercial product. 
where I can just, you know, pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, you know, Alan Gray has an issue with their client facing website. Our customers can't use our software. So um, that's a massive consideration in, in kind of the commercial world, you know, when you're relying on the software to run your business 24 seven. So that's super important. Okay, so um, for instance, you, you guys, you know, you wanna, you wanna build a piece of software, you know you need a specific piece of that and you're, you're going out into the world and you wanna, you wanna find a good piece of open source software that, that will suit your, your needs, okay? So firstly, you kinda wanna gather as much information as possible. And obviously your first stop is Google. Um, you Google around, Often, you know, the first 10, 15 results, you'll find, you know, the best, if you Google best HTTP client for JavaScript, it'll become pretty clear um, what the most popular ones are because kind of the cream rises to the top. You could speak to peers, friends, uh, people in the industry. You can go to meetups, lots of technical meetups around tech. You can do something simple like look at Stack Overflow for this particular library or technology and go, you know, how many questions are there? How many questions have been answered? There are lots of kind of white papers and consultancy agencies out there that, that publish success stories. You know, what companies are using this? Are big companies using it? Are they invested in it? So lots, lots and lots of data points there to kind of point you in the right direction. At a practical level, um, if you go somewhere like GitHub, and I've taken Spring Boot as an example here, Spring Boot is highly popular um, across all industries and makes it easy in the Java world to spin up microservices. Um, and I have a couple of arrows here pointing to very important or pertinent information. Um, so let's look at contributors, okay? So 918, that's, that's a considerable amount of contributors for an open source project, okay? So a lot of people are writing code and they're they're, they're contributing code to this. And if you click through to that, you kind of want to see how many people or how much code um, these people are contributing. You don't really want to have one guy contributing 99% of the code because that, that then this piece of software has a heavy reliance on just one person. How up to date is this software? So I can see that three days ago, somebody committed. And if I just kind of look down, I can see 17, 28 days ago, so this repository is very active. People are constantly contributing code to this. So I, so I know there's probably a pretty good community around this. What we chatted about earlier, licensing. This one has an Apache 2 license, which means it's, it's very permissive. I can take it, I can use it, not a problem there. I can see that the version is 2.7. So there's been a number of major versions of this software. So all of these bits of information together are, are good indicators of, um, you know, of, of how, how up to date the software is, how many people are interested in it, how many people are using it. If I look at something equivalent, NPM, so this is where code packages for uh, the Node.js kind of um, ecosystem live. And this again is Axios, so this is that HTTP library. You can see here I have lots of little badges. Um, one of them says coverage, 94%. So that tells me that this code has lots of tests, lots of unit tests, automated test coverage. Um, and for each of these little badges, I can click through and I can kind of see what those tests are um, and, and what the success and fail rate is. Um, I can also see that this gets 121 million downloads a month. So, you know, it's, it's, it's exceptionally popular. So that's a really strong indicator of the usage of this um, out there. So I've chosen my library. Okay, I've gone through all these, all these points, my library or my server or my messaging system, whatever this open source piece of software is. Um, and I wanna kind of ensure that as a business or even as an as a individual going forward using this, how can I minimize the impact of change, okay? so. How do I get as many of the benefits that I already mentioned and as few of the pitfalls? One is to use open protocols. What I mean by that is, for instance, HTTP is an open protocol. That's what the web is built on. So if, if you're using a server of some kind or something that sends and receives messages or packets, you're best to stick with open protocols. 
which generally means that there will be other products that will also use that same protocol and will make it easier to swap them out down the line if you have to. Um, using just a core amount of functionality. Um, so I can give a, a personal use case there. Uh, in my previous job, we used a product called Spring, which is very popular in the Java ecosystem. And it, it gives you lots and lots of additional functionality. But what was decided at that business was we would write as much plain vanilla JavaScript or Java um, as possible. And we would use the minimum amount of core functionality that we wanted or needed from that software. Meaning that if we were ever to have to move off of that, we would be, um, we would be you know, in a better position. We weren't as kind of coupled or tied to that software and would make that move easier. Another one is that you can completely abstract um, the functionality and something we actually did here at Alan Gray is we, we use Scala, which is an open source language. Um, and we couldn't find a really nice HDB library uh, for Scala. So what we did was we picked another one off the shelf. We wrote a layer of code, an extraction layer that hid this piece of software. And all of our other systems, they only use this abstraction, meaning that on the surface, all of our other systems interacting with it, they don't know that we're using this third party library, which again, makes it much easier to swap out down the line. So you can see a lot of this is kind of abstraction, you know, not depending directly on this piece of software, all with the idea that if you have to move off it down the line, it'll make it uh, as painless as possible, hopefully. And in terms of third party libraries that we might use, um, what we do here and a lot of companies would do is they'll put kind of a caching layer between our network and the internet, and we'll save copies of these third party libraries there as well, which gives us that little bit of uh, buffer and safety. Okay, security. So this, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, is pretty big, you, you know, particularly as a financial services company, we really want to make sure our software is as secure as possible, as bug free as possible. Um, and even as an individual, this applies to um, keeping your software up to date. So always be aware of what the latest versions are because generally the latest versions will have little patches, little bug fixes, a little uh, you know features, enhancements. And a lot of ecosystems will actually come with um, you know, a command or a tool that will automatically tell you what software is out of date. In the NPM, that JavaScript, ecosystem, there's a command called npm audit, which will actually give you um, um, an npm outdated, actually, which will give you which libraries are outdated so you can update them yourself. Um, here, we need something a bit a bit more robust. So we, we use a third party product called SNCC. And what they do is they will scan all of our um, third party libraries and they will report on any known vulnerabilities. So we do that internally, and it allows us to be on top of those, update to a version where the vulnerability doesn't exist, um, and know, or at least have confidence that our software is, uh, is pretty secure uh, from that perspective. So often there's open source software out there that's exceptionally critical. Um, and we do use some pieces of this. It's software that cannot go down. We rely on it absolutely, and our systems rely on it. And in that case, what can you do? Well, I mean, over the years, um, a business model has evolved where a company will take over ownership or produce a piece of open source software um, for free to use. So anybody can use it at their own will. But if you want expert support for that software, you'll have to pay for it. Or if you want enhanced features or advanced features, you'll also have to pay for it. Um, so for a number of open source software, that Alan Gray has, even though the software is free for us to use, we need to have the security that if something goes wrong, we don't have the in-house skills, we need to call up somebody, you know, we need to get our systems back online as soon as possible. So that's one thing we, we, we definitely want. Um, I think I have time for just one small high profile story um, around the open source world. Uh, so this was a headline, it's actually in 2014, it was how one programmer broke the internet by deleting a tiny piece of code. Um, what this kind of stems from is the fact that 
in a lot of open source ecosystems, smaller libraries, you know, are are used by a slightly bigger library and used again by a slightly bigger library. So there's this chain of dependencies around pieces of software. And this one is from the Node ecosystem. So this is a small JavaScript package um, that most people could write themselves. And what it does is if you give it a string, it'll just pad the left-hand side or the right-hand side with whatever string you give it, zeros or ones or another letter. So what happened was the developer who published this um, open source piece of software on uh, NPM, he had another package called Kik, K-I-K. And um, there was a, a Canadian company also called Kik who had many, many millions of users globally. They had Kik copyrighted in many countries and they wanted to publish a library of their own. So they had asked him quite nicely initially, you know, would you mind you know, renaming yours or changing it because we'd like to publish ours. And he said, no, he was uh, self-taught. Everything that he knew was from the open source world. And he had that kind of strong anti-establishment and anti-commercial mindset. So he said, no way. So they tried to kind of strong arm him. Uh, he refused. Um, so this company Kick went to NPM where the code is hosted. Um, and they, they asked, NPM, you know, what are your, what are your, co what's your code of conduct? What are your kind of rules by which you make decisions like this? So NPM decided that Kick had the right to to use it because rightfully, if somebody came along and decided to install Kick, they would they would rightfully think it was belonging to this global company. This developer wasn't happy about this, and what he did was he deleted Kick along with 260 or 70 other packages that he wrote in the NPM repository, one of them being leftpad, this little function here. Um, leftpad was actually used by Node itself. It was used by React, which is one of the largest front-end frameworks, used by lots of people. So all of a sudden, lots and lots of projects started to fail to build because this no longer existed. Um, what happened was another programmer noticed this and because it was deleted, he was freely um, open to just publish a fix, which he did. And within 10 minutes, everything was back to normal. So th this kind of highlights some interesting things in the open source world. Um, you know, lots of software is for free, um, but as a software developer who publishes stuff, you know, should he have deleted that software? He had a responsibility to other developers in the open source world. Um, to to not do that, but he did. He didn't really hurt NPM. He actually hurt everyone using that software. And then the strength of community came along and quickly rectified that. Um, so it's kind of like the power and then the down downsides and then the power of, of the kind of open source community mindset at work there. What's really interesting is this is Leftpad. Uh, so leftpad, you no longer need to use this because JavaScript itself, the language comes with something that you can, you can use to do this. But there's still two and a half million weekly downloads of this piece of software. So a lot of people probably didn't even realize that under the hood, software they were using that was built using something else, that was built something using else, that used this um, had even disappeared because it, it had disappeared for such a small amount of time. And I will just very briefly talk about open source Alan Gray. Um, we do use some Microsoft stuff. Um, on the retail side, we don't. Um, we use pretty much all open source languages. So Scala, Golang, React, Node, uh, practically every software development language out there now is open source, um, free to take, free to use. And we use lots of other open source software, Nginx a load balancer, GitLab we use to kind of host our software. It's similar to GitHub, if you're familiar with that. Docker, Kubernetes, where we run our microservices. So lots of software there. And I was just going to show this um, because the slide pack I've used is actually an open source slide pack. And one of the conditions of using that slide pack, which is icons and backgrounds, is that I show this slide and to be a, a, a a good member of the open source community and do do my bit, um, I'm obliged to show this slide uh, to you guys. Okay, that's, that's it for me. Um, I hope you've 
enjoyed um, um, the slides and I hope you've learned something. Thank you so much, Barry. Um, yeah, just for your knowledge on the open source uh, you know, world, it's interesting to know how IT has pioneered just in the democratic transparency and free space, just, just to speak. You know, it's also good to know that it's not just that straightforward. There are licenses that we need to be aware of. So thank you for a well-structured and delivered talk. You've given You're us welcome. a lot of very practical insights. I like the way you use the Spring Boot and Axios projects as illustrative examples, as well as the kick lift pad story. Very interesting. Thank you once again. You are indeed a very good member of the open source community. I like <laughs> the last slide there. Some interesting insights are coming from our chat box as well. Uh, you can't be too old to get a chance at Alan Gray. It's all about your capabilities. So let's keep the questions coming. Our expert guests will do their best to respond. Next, we hand over to Kimon, uh, who I have the privilege to have worked with at the PMB uh, campus. Uh, as a student, Kimon, the floor is yours and welcome back. Thank you, Mandla. It's um, it's nice to be back. Um, okay, so I don't have any slides to share. I'm just going to be talking about my journey from UKZN, being a student from UKZN as well. Um, so I grew up in Peter Maritzburg and studied at the UKZN Peter Maritzburg campus. Um, there I obtained my computer science and IT degree. And in my final year of undergrad, I applied for jobs. Um, however, I did decide that I would like to study further and do my honours and I, I wasn't ready to move um, from home just yet. So that's what I did. I completed my honours the following year in computer science. And in that year, I applied to Alan Gray and this was the company I had chosen to proceed with because I had obviously, I did get the offers back from the year before, but I decided that I actually liked the sound of Ellen Gray and chose to go this route instead. Um, so this was a pretty daunting time at the end of my honors year, obviously. And I think I was pretty numb through the whole process, um, thinking about having to leave home and my family and move to Cape Town. Um, and I don't have family in Cape Town. Um, but apart from a little bit of admin, I just had to pack up my clothes and catch a flight to Cape Town. Because as Monique said, um, Alan Gray does sort you out pretty well with the relocation and corporate apartments when you move. So I was pretty much sorted and that's all I had to worry about. Um, yeah, and I heard that a student from Westfall, the Westfall Honours class had also gotten, gotten a job at Alan Gray. So I got her number. I didn't know her at all, but it was just comforting to know that someone else from my background had also was also starting there with me and I kind of had like a friend to start with. Um, yeah, so I flew to Cape Town and in my first week we went through a whole orientation process with all of the Ellen Gray January new starters. And in the second week we split up into our departments for department specific onboarding. Um, as Monique mentioned, there is a three month boot camp that the IT grad graduates go through. So that's obviously what I went into next. Most of this boot camp is a blur to me because it was very overwhelming. We did, we had to, we went through so much of, of technology and there was so much of learning and just a whole lot of new information. Um, and although three months sounds like a long time, like each week was a different topic. So we moved through things quite fast. Um, and I feel like I just didn't get enough time to grasp it, but that was okay. Um, also, one of the girls that had started in the IT, well, started with our group was actually not going to become a developer, but a business analyst instead. And I remember thinking throughout the boot camp, like, I may not be cut out for this role as a developer. I don't think I'm technically conf competent. Maybe I should be a business analyst instead. Um, yeah, so I was having some major imposter syndrome. Um, at this point, I also hadn't even updated my LinkedIn profile to say that I had started a position at Ellen Gray because we were on a six month probation period. And a lot of us were honestly just afraid that we would get let go if we didn't do well in the boot camp. 
um, this was silly of us because after having chats with our manager, he was like, no, um, that's not the case at all. You have to do something seriously wrong to be let go. And um, you don't have to excel at the boot camp, but like the probation period is just, you know, just the standard that they do. Um, so, you know, we, we pushed through. Or, uh, I wasn't the only grad that was struggling. My fellow, other, my fellow UKZN colleagues were also struggling, but so were the the students from other university as well um yeah so we we pushed through we the boot camp took place in a training room at our office here in cape town um a nice training room we all had our computers and we bonded really well because we spent most of our time in this training room and everybody helped each other along with the projects and assignments and if we didn't understand each other and one of our colleagues did we would get good explanations from them. The coaches were also really helpful. I do remember Barry giving a talk there as well. Um, and also during this time, we were given a mentor to support us um, as we onboarded. Um, and this mentor was not there for technical help, but rather to be a friend, to answer any questions that we had, um, to give good advice, especially when we were feeling self-doubt. Um, so that was really great. And my mentor really helped me through. Um, yeah, and then three months later, we joined our actual teams on the IT floor. Um, so this is our first time like moving up to sit with everybody else. Um, it's a nice open space floor. So there's no offices. Everybody literally sits next to each other. So everyone is nice and approachable. Um, fortunately, I joined a big team and there were other grads that started with me. So I wasn't alone there either and things went well I had a lot to learn um, and I was ashamed that really small tasks took me a really long time to figure out because I just didn't understand the context um, and yeah a lot of things but um, things got better and yeah I also felt really bad asking for help all the time I thought I was really bothering people but people were really nice and patient um, and none of them seemed to have gotten annoyed with me or they hit it really well um, yeah and I, I feel like I survived um, I got through my first year I did mostly front-end work and started back-end work towards the end of the year so now I'm kind of doing both um, yeah and those thoughts of wanting to become a business analyst kind of just evaporated I don't even know at what point but I think I just enjoyed doing the work that I was doing and I enjoyed coding I'm not someone who um, who likes to sit in front of the computer the whole day and just code uh, I actually like to talk to people and interact with people and being here at Alan Gray with people who are similar to me um, has made that easier and I've been able to 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 have a lot of interactions and just be myself, which has been great. Um, yeah, and fast forward almost four years later, I'm still here at Alan Gray. I'm very happy where I am. I'm really happy with the work that I'm doing and all the opportunities that I have to learn. Um, like I'm interested in learning new languages and I'm now in that that mental headspace where I'm not just stressing and, and struggling to do my task tasks at hand like that's gotten easier so now I, I'm able to focus on like my future goals and what I want to learn and the, the other languages that I want to start um, learning so that's great um, yeah and I, I really feel that I'm pushed to perform well and I'm being challenged and I'm really motivated so yeah I also really enjoy living in Cape Town, being away from my family is hard, but I mean, technology has given us, has provided us with video calls and all of that. So I speak to them every day. Um, obviously, I still have moments of self-doubt because I don't know everything. So there's obviously going to be times where I um, will feel really stuck, but it, it really helps to have so many good people around me who are always eager to help um, and always help, um, always there to motivate like new learning opportunities for me um yeah and i and i just like to say if there's one thing that i've learned from this whole experience is it it is that you should be knowledge hungry all the time even if it's got nothing to do with your daily duties like the more you learn the better it is for yourself the more contact context you'll have the better understanding you'll have and whenever you you're in a space where you don't understand what's going on at least having some some prior knowledge you'll be able to 
at least know where to start looking. Yeah, and that's it for me. Thank you. Wow, I'm so inspired. I'm so proud. Thank you so much, Kimon, and well done. Alan Gray, you've done well, you know, for your contribution in, Simo in uh, Kimon's uh, growth. Uh, it's just such a very encouraging and real account. You know, I like the statement that you made that one of your bosses said, you know, there must be something serious that you would have done, you know, wrong for you to miss out on an opportunity at, at Alan Gray. You know, so it's good to hear that you're well supported with a mentor by technical experts. So thank you for sharing your experience uh, and, and for coming through just to greet us once again. Uh, to everyone, it's now time for our audio questions, and uh, we are five minutes before our closing time, so we'll probably have time for about three questions. Um, I will just encourage us just to raise our hands, you know, if you would like to get a chance to talk to our guests today. I have noted there were a few questions that were posted. Uh, they were answered. I don't think we've got outstanding questions in the chat box. Um, so just to encourage you, you heard 1,200 applicants, only 18. You want to get noticed. You want to get noted, and now is your first chance. Let's have some leadership skills. Let's have some people uh, being confident just to ask some questions. Do we have any takers? While you gather your... Uh, Guts, come on. I, I will pose a question to you and just say, you know, if you had any advice, you know, to UKZN, you know, what would it be? Um, so I'll just repeat what I said in my talk that I, I really yeah. think that it's good to be knowledge hungry. I think I wasn't when I first started. Um, yeah. I think I was just focused on getting the jobs in front of me done that things are, that I wasn't taking an interest in things happening around me like talks happening around me any knowledge shares happening around me and it's really good yeah. to actually get involved and and be a part of those conversations so that I can learn more um also just I think just hang in there like with, with those feelings of self-doubt they're completely normal um and you will you will make it through like no matter how nervous you are especially like coming into the working world where things are going to be really different um but just hang in there because you're not alone there's a lot of other people that will be in the same position as you um i mean when i started at Ellen gray i i lit, there was probably like five people from uk that in there so that made me feel really great there were people that have left um their homes as well and were in the same situation as me um yeah so just hang there remember to have a good work-life balance like don't only work um don't only work really hard but also remember to have fun and relax your mind and really things will and that will that will help you deal with stress better as well Awesome, thank you so much. And just one question for me to Barry and to Monique. Uh, Barry, um, if you could give us advice, you know, as Computer Science UK again, just in terms of serving you better, what would it be? And just while you think about that, I'll just ask Monique, you know, just in case anybody else has got further questions, is there a way they can get in touch with you? You know, um, yeah, I, I can I can answer maybe hopefully first. I think Kim, Kim had said a statement that was, you know, she was afraid that she didn't know everything, but you'll never know everything. I mean, I've been in the industry 20 years. You're constantly learning. That's kind of, that's one of the beauties, I guess, of of IT and tech. It's it's interesting. It's fast moving. You're always learning. Um, and if that's, if that's the kind of mentality you have, um, I think you'll really really enjoy, you know, um, a career in kind of software development and tech. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. Monique, yeah? Yes, yes, I'll go. Um, I'm actually getting heaps of messages, direct messages on the side. So I've been typing oh, away um, awesome. just on, on the process for 20, 24. for 2023. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have any space at the moment for uh, grad intake 2023. Um, I think we were actually looking for 15. And as I said, we've got 18 offers out already. Um, 
so I, I do encourage you to just add your your details to um, the the QR code or the the server that I sent. Um, and if we do, if anything happens, uh, anything changes, and we do decide to open those spaces up or or hire more people, then I will be in contact with um, with Lena uh, or, or someone just to kind of say yes, here's a role. Can people apply or at least uh, give me a heads up if they're interested? Um, so I am also getting a lot of uh, requests for my email address, which is great. <laughs> I'm just nervous that I don't get to them yes. um, because there are so many, you know, just from the 1,200 applications, uh, it's opening a can of worms, to be completely honest. Exactly. Um, exactly. And if people are all emailing me, I wouldn't be able to get back to everyone and I'd hate that that experience to be had. So I just want to be completely honest and say like I'm a little bit nervous about giving my email address out just because of yes. actually be like getting back to everyone. Yeah. yeah. So if 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 um if everyone like if you're interested in internship next year, then please complete the document or the, the form. And if you're interested in 2024 grad, then please also give me your details and, and that'll be great. We can Thank so basically so what the approach would be next year, like basically we'll we'll send out the advert, we'd open it and um just give everyone access to it first, which is great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monique. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I can see we've got one hand up. So well done, Antoine, buddy, mommy. Please feel free to mute yourself. You have the floor. Uh, um, afternoon, everyone. Af afternoon. Please go. Yeah, uh, my, my name is Antoine. So I, I, I did um, an, uh, an undergrad in computer engineering, a BSc in, in computer engineering. And right now I'm doing my master's. I'm about to, to complete my master's in computer engineering. So I just wanted to know, um, do you have programs for, for graduates, like um, post postgraduate programs? So are, are, you, are your programs also open to, to postgraduates? Uh, yes, they are. Oh, okay. In, in, in short, and, yes, they are. So oh, anyone okay, third, year, third year and up, um, we, would, we would definitely consider your application uh, as long as they were available spots to hire okay and also secondly um i'm i'm a foreign national so i'm, I'm originally from cameroon and so um how 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 easy is, is it for like foreign nationals to, to also apply do we um, are we treated at the same uh, standard as um, citizens or like are there other other requirements so we do hire foreign uh, foreigners um but we we don't assist with any sort of visas or anything like that. So um, it, we, we actually only hire people who have become permanent residents, unfortunately. Okay. 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 All right. Thank great. you so much. Thank, thanks, Thank an, an, Antoine. That, that's a great question there from you. Uh, moral of the story is you're not too old. Uh, even if you've got a degree, there are opportunities for you. At the end of the day, I believe it's the, it's the capabilities they are looking for. Uh, Barry, are you good? Uh, would you like to say any last words? Um, I guess, you know, stick at it. As I said, it's uh, it can be daunting. Um, the entire world of tech is vast and, you know, but it's it's interesting and it's rewarding. Uh, and I think I think it's a great it's a great area to get into um, going forward. I mean, the world is the world is soon to be built on software. It currently is, and it's it's moving that direction. So, um, in terms of a career and longevity, I think uh, and and kind of an exciting industry. It's a great it's a great way to go. Thank you so much, Barry. Uh, Kia, you are last. Uh, uh, speaker for today uh, please feel free to unmute yourself uh, that's the last question we'll be taking because we've reached our time kia go for it okay uh, good afternoon everyone thank you so much for the tech talk uh, regarding alan gray uh, one question that i do have uh, i understand you guys said that 1200 applications come through and only 15 get accepted uh, obviously there has to be something that stands out in those 15 students. So any advice or what 
with like the recruiters to be looking for that is definitely a standout that will make sure I won't say guarantee but will ensure to get a better chance of getting in an acting grade. Thank you. Okay, great. I'll um although Kimone was very involved in uh well you were involved in in interviews and uh and the internship. Um so I don't know if you want to say add anything to that. Um so it's it's very difficult uh to go through so many. It took out like weeks and and hours and hours and hours and um uh, yeah it was it was quite a, a lengthy process um and i think it was probably about 180 hours of interviewing of um, some very senior people who <laughs> took a lot of time and energy um so initially we got to start obviously with um filters uh, which obviously is where trans Scripts really, really help. Um, I know the rest of the business looks at, uh, I think it's like a 70% uh, GPA, whereas we really focus on the maths and computer science. Um, so even if someone has a lower GPA, we'd really look a little bit deeper into the transcripts, which is why uh, the IT process is a little bit longer for us to screen because we, we you know, even if you show up as a lower GPA, we still often open and, and go through your actual transcripts. Um, so that is one indicator that we do need to apply just because of the volume. Um, and then when it comes to the interviewing, we look for a few things. Uh, so we have an hour and a half worth of an interview and they would, would basically take you through some, some problem solving, uh, give you, I think there's about five questions that you do online uh, with us. And then there'll also be a cultural section where you'd be asked a few questions about, you know, the different experiences you've had um, and how you've dealt with them. And it's really about, for us, I think it's about uh, how you've um, gotten through difficult, well, not even difficult times, but how you've um, sort of succeeded in your in your studies, what you're proud of. Um, so we're, the culture fit is, is very important, um, how you've um, engaged with your, your, you know, your your various, uh, in, in your projects, what part you played, um, how you helped others. So I think it's very important um, for us to, we've got quite a collaborative space at Alan Gray, and we look for those those qualities in people. Um, and added to that, as Kimone said, you need to have a growth mindset. So you need to be able to um, be curious and want to learn because that gap is actually quite big if, you, if you're not ready to apply yourself. Um, so you need to be very open to absorb different ways of doing things and taking the skills you've learned in university and really applying them to problem solve and absorb new information. So um, it's it's a very lengthy and expensive uh, process, but as I said, we've we've had heaps amount of value from from it. Thank you so fun. much, Monique. <laughs> cool. Uh, Kimon, Kimon, do you have anything you'd like to add there? Just what's what's it's one apart? Uh, no, nothing to add. I think Monique's covered it all. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we've come to the end of our tech talk. Thank you so much to Monique, to Barry, and to Kimon for coming through. Thank you for answering questions in the chat box. Uh, if students have got any other questions, please, please feel free, you know, just to use the available channels of communication to Alan Gray, just to post them. I trust that you've been inspired and equipped. And uh, thank you to Alan Gray for coming through and also for giving our students working opportunities. We're so appreciative of that. We invite everyone to our next Tech Talk, which I believe will be by Microsoft in a few weeks time. But in between that, there are going to be other talks, you know, targeted to the wider college community. So thank you to everyone. And I wish everyone a very good afternoon. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thank you. Bye.